It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my first question is for the Acting Premier. Can the Acting Premier tell us if the Premier has spoken with Dean French, his Chief of Staff, concerning the Toronto Star report that he attempted to order police arrests and the Globe and Mail report that he personally intervened to have Ali Ken Valshi fired from Ontario Power Generation? Acting Premier. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm truly looking forward to questions from the official opposition today, Speaker, that we can talk about the substance of our fall, or of our fall economic statement, our plan for the people. Yeah. Truly look forward. To, I know the NDP don't want to talk about that because it brings relief. It brings relief to 1.1 million low-income people in the province of Ontario. Our lift program. And I understand why they don't want to talk about that, Speaker, because it is a program that brings true relief. If you earn $30,000 a year or less, you will no longer pay provincial income tax in the Thank province you. of Ontario. Yes, Speaker, for the families in Ontario that we're caring about, relief is here. Here, here. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, the government might not want to answer questions on this matter, but the people of Ontario have a right to know. The Integrity Commissioner has indicated that he may conduct an inquiry Order. on these issues, but by law, he's only allowed to report his Before findings to order. the Premier. Will the government commit to making those findings public, Speaker? Minister. Thank you very much. Speaker, once again, I can tell you that when we inherited a $15 billion deficit from the Liberal government, sadly supported 97 per cent of the time by the NDP, which is how we got into the Brantford Brant come to order. We brought three things to bear. Number one, we looked for efficiencies and found $3.2 billion in efficiencies through through great work of people like our pres uh, president of our Treasury Board and all of the uh, caucus members who contributed ideas. And we turned around and delivered $2.7 billion of that back into the pockets of the people of Ontario. You think the NDP would be celebrating something like that, Celebrate. Speaker, as opposed to criticizing us. Thank you. Final supplement. Order. Start the clock. Final supplementary. Well, Ontario's numbers man should know that they actually supported the Liberal government 49 per cent of the time, and the New Democrats did 53 per cent of the time, a whole 4 per cent difference, Speaker. That's what Ontario Minister deserve of Children, to Community and Social However, Services come to order. Stated that he would always encourage his staff to serve children, to power. community, and social Yet services. Come to order. Reports this week indicate that government staff are. The Minister of Children, Community, and Social Services come to order. I'll give you extra time. Sorry to interrupt. Yet multiple media reports this week indicate that the government staff are berated. Uh, and fear losing their jobs when they raise any facts that challenge the Premier or the Premier's Chief of Staff. If government staff are encouraged to speak truth to power, as the Premier did, why are so many of them telling reporters Order. they would lose their jobs if they did that? Minister. Thank you very much for the question. Well, let me tell you a little bit about the great work that our staff, our caucus, our cabinet and our Premier have done today. With the, with the not accepting the Liberals' surtax, we have individuals who claim tax credits now, such as seniors, those with disabilities, and those who claim Ontario's medical expense tax credit, would have suffered under the NDP-backed Liberal plan of these tax increases in January. We've said no, and as a result, 150,000 filers with allowable Ontario medical expense who would have paid 320 more dollars in January they will not be paying that that's what our staff have developed a plan for the people next question 
Leader of the Opposition. Acting Premier Speaker, can the Acting Premier explain why Ken uh, Bendarek is no longer serving as Chief of Staff to the Minister of Public Safety? Acting Premier. Thank you very much. Let me continue talking about our plan for the people. I can tell you the great staff that we have, the great caucus that we have assembled, that the people of Ontario voted to send here to Queen Park, the great cabinet that Premier Ford has put together, and a great leader in Premier Ford himself. We have put together a team that, with that tax credit that I spoke about just a moment ago, that puts $35 million back in the pockets of families that need it most. Seniors, those with disabilities, and those who are, who are collecting a medical expense tax credit. $35 million they were about to be taxed by a Liberal tax that the NDP supported. Speaker. That is the reality. That is what they don't want to talk about. Speaker. But I'm not afraid to stand up here Response. and tell the people all about the relief that's coming their way. Order. Start the clock. Supplementary. Speaker, reports indicate that Mr. Vendarek was one of the few brave staff who challenged Dean French, the Premier's Chief of Staff, when he made the completely inappropriate demand that police be ordered not only to make arrests, ordered to make arrests, but to time those arrests so that they would make it on to the noon news. Can the Acting Premier confirm or deny that Mr. Bindarak lost his job after speaking out against the inappropriate Senator, direction Bond, coming from the Premier's office? Acting Premier. Thank you very much. What I can tell you uh, about our cannabis plan, uh, designed by our Premier, our Cabinet, our caucus, Order. our whole team, all of our staff, is a plan Position that is to forward. protect children, a plan that is to keep our streets safe, and a plan that is to curb the illicit activity. I realize the NDP may not have bought into that plan, the plan that is going to be a thorough and proper sale of cannabis through Ontario. They're more, uh, they're more interested, Speaker, as I said yesterday. They deal in Order. chaos. We deal in confidence. The NDP deals in resistance. We will deliver results. Final supplementary. Speaker, can the acting premier tell us how much public money went into paying for the severance of Mr. Bendarek and other staff who may have been dismissed for speaking out? Minister. I can tell you that there's $500 million of public money being put back into our lift program, the low income individual and family tax credit. Now, I realize. I realize the NDP don't want those people, our low-income people, to get a lift, because here's what they said. Unfort this is a Pardon. quote from the NDP member from Hamilton West, Ancaster Dundas. She says, quote, talking about people who learn, er, earn so little that they, in fact, don't need a tax break. Well, Speaker, I think our low-income families Pardon. do need that $500 million tax break that we're giving. That's the numbers they don't want to talk about, Speaker. Next question. Leader of the Opposition. I, uh, my next question is also for the Acting Premier, Premier but what low-income people don't need is a government that rips them off by two grand by cancelling their $15 minimum wage increase, and what they don't need is a government that spends $300 million on tax, base, uh, tax breaks to the richest Ontarian speaker. That's what people don't need. But the Acting Premier is part of a government team, and he must know that it's not appropriate to intervene at Ontario Power Generation and fire executives is triggering a half a million dollar severance, another thing that the people of Ontario don't need, or ordering police to make arrests that look good on the noon hour news, another thing that Ontarians don't need. Has he personally received any, uh, raised any of these concerns or issues with the Premier? Acting Premier, thank you very much. You know this. Uh 
This government, our Ford government, we are bringing relief to families, Speaker. We've been bringing relief to individuals. We've talked about those. But let me talk about the relief that we are bringing to the business community because they were about to Remember receive Waterloo, come to a order. surtax, Premier, or Speaker. They were about to receive a surtax that would cause them yet again to have fewer employees. What we are doing is returning to 7,000. 900 businesses will not have the increase that the Liberal government was bringing in September. That will save up to $40,000 per business that they can reinvest. Speaker, I'm a lifelong business person. We know that when business has the, can, can find a dime, we invest it in our companies. We hire more people. That's all we business people have Response. ever done, Speaker. That's what we do. Taking that $40,000, they will be reinvesting it in their business and hiring more people in the province of Ontario, Speaker. Members, take your seat. Start the clock. Supplementary. Speaker, people expect a government that sets high standards and actually governs in the public interest. Instead, the Premier and Dean French, his hand-picked chief of staff, seem to think that their titles mean that they can do whatever they want, whenever they want. Whether it's ordering police to arrest people in time for the noon hour news or paying someone half a million dollars for a single day's work and sticking the people of Ontario with the bill because the Premier just didn't like that guy. Does the Acting Premier think that this is an acceptable way to behave? Acting Premier. You know, the Canadian uh, Federation of Independent Business talked about our LIFT program. The NDP won't, but they said CFIB was particularly pleased to see that the government is helping low-income earners while providing some relief to employers from the 23 per cent minimum wage hike. The LIFT credit will keep more money in employees' pockets without threatening jobs. That's what they had to say. The Canadian Taxpayers Federation said about LIFT, low-income workers across Ontario will benefit from the tax announced, which will save individual workers $850 per year, letting 1.1 million low-income workers in Ontario keep the money they earn is the right thing to do. The Chamber of Commerce said combined these steps towards a more more competitive and prosperous economy. Ontario is strongest when industry Response. and government work together, and we look forward to working with the government. Speaker, it's obvious Ontario is open for business. Thank you. Stop the clock. Start the clock. Next question, member for Etobicoke Centre. question is for the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Minister, today we mark National Housing Day. We know that for the past 15 years, the previous Liberal government failed to listen to the concerns of Ontarians. There have been countless calls for increased housing supply. There have been countless calls to create more community housing for the most vulnerable. I know I've heard that from my very own constituents. Both those calls, however, were ignored. Mr. Speaker, we are now in the midst of a housing crisis. Can the minister please explain the importance of National Housing Day and tell us how he and our government for the people order. is doing to fix this? Thank you. Yeah, Member for York Centre, come to order. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thank you, Speaker. And I want to thank the, uh, the member for Etobicoke Centre for this important question and highlighting this urgent issue. National Housing Day is a day to acknowledge and call on all levels of government to do more to provide housing that is affordable, not just across our great province, but across the country. As it currently stands, we need more housing. Our government has acknowledged this, and we've taken immediate steps to address the crisis. I've been working with my ministry to find ways to cut red tape and to speed up the system and increase housing supply. This is a top priority for myself and our government for the people, and I look forward to working with the people of Ontario on providing more housing supply. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Minister. I know you've been working tremendously hard on this file. We all know that housing is incredibly important. It is often the first step to bringing people out of poverty and getting them back on their feet. 
Mr. Speaker, while our government for the people is putting great efforts in resolving this crisis, housing requires the collaboration of all levels of government and stakeholders. Can the minister please expand on how he is working with other levels of government and stakeholders so that we can create more housing that is affordable and create more community housing for those that need it the most? Minister. I, I want to thank the member for that great question. Uh, the lack of housing is uh, not an issue that was created overnight, nor is it an issue that can be fixed with one so solution. It requires, as the member says, the help from all levels of government and stakeholders alike. That's why, since I took office, I've been speaking to hundreds of housing and development stakeholders to find a solution to start building more housing and increase that supply that is just so vital in our province. I've also spoken with different levels of government to try to find a way that we can all work collaboratively to streamline building and repairing our community housing. I welcome all suggestions on how to improve housing across this province, and I would encourage constituents to go to ontario.ca forward slash housing supply to Arts. contribute to our consultation. I look forward to continuing the conversation. I want to thank this member. You're an excellent member for your constituents. Thank you for your question. Next question, the member for Mesquite, James Bay. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the uh, acting premier. Mr. Minister, yesterday there were cuts from your government that we learned and that will be affecting the Francophone world. Uh, yesterday we got the news that the Conservatives de decided to cancel $2.9 million for the Gilles Desjardins Centre. It's an art centre of the Ottawa Francophone Centre. This is absolutely irresponsible from you, Mr. Minister. It's not enough for you to eliminate uh, the office uh, that defends our constitu constitutional rights and to cancel what should have been our university. My question is simple. Why are you so determined to attack uh, the Franco-Ontarian community. Acting Premier. Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. The Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thank you for the question. First of all, uh, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to say that our province has a unique cultural fabric, and that Francophone language and culture are an integral part of Ontario's rich culture. We would never make a decision solely to harm the Francophone community. This was a decision made, made out of fiscal responsibility. The former Liberal government announced $2.9 million for a project to help with debt repayment at La Nouvelle Saint-Gilles Desjardins Theatre building, even though no project proposal or implementation plan had been made available. It is actually sad to see Response. that this question is being asked, given that the Liberals were giving money away with no details provided. Depending on eligibility, there are funding avenues. Thank you very much. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister, it seems that for, your, for you, our constitutional right, our education, and now our culture are for you but a mere financial affair. Next week, our leader, Andrew Horvat, will table a motion to re-establish the French Language Service Commissioner and the University de l'Ontario Francais. <laughs> Minister, is it, more, it is more than clear that the Conservatives have no interest in assuming that they have left Franco-Ontarians like myself behind. As if we are, we and our rights, education and heritage were unimportant to you, Minister, are you going to support this motion? Members, will please take your seats. Minister, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. As we've said, and as I've said as well, the francophone language, the culture, is an integral part of who we are as Ontarians. We, Mr. Speaker, were elected to restore trust and accountability. 
The Liberals sad saddled us with over $347 billion in debt. Making promises to many people is not the way that you get out of, fiscal response to, of, out of the fiscal mess. You get out of a fiscal mess by being responsible. Our government is committed to making fiscally responsible decisions on behalf of all Ontarians. La Nouvelle Seine is welcome to work with us to find funding for a solution, and that is something that we will do, whether it be through Response. the grants or other sources, we will work to ensure that the facility is kept open. Next question, the member for Peterborough Kawartha. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Finance. Ontario's economy has struggled for the past 15 years under the Liberal government, and according to the Fraser Institute, we even had a decade that it was the worst performance in Canada. We all know the Liberals left our province saddled with debt and uncompetitive on the world stage. Our government was elected to turn things around. Last week's fall economic statement proved to Ontario that we're committed to fixing the mess the Liberals left behind. It also proved to Canada that we're determined to once again make Ontario the economic engine of our country. We called on the federal government to take decisive action in their own economic statement this past fall to support businesses in Ontario and across Canada. Could the minister please share his reactions to the federal government's fall economic statement from yesterday? Question. Minister of Finance. Thank you, uh, Speaker, and thank you to the member for Peterborough Kawartha for the question. Premier Ford's leadership to restore business competitiveness in Ontario led to the measures announced yesterday in the federal uh, fall economic statement. We welcome the federal measure to allow businesses to accelerate the expensing of many depreciable assets. However, the Premier also took a stand for families and asked the federal government to be honest about how much their job-killing carbon tax will actually cost. We're disappointed the federal government chose to continue ignoring the damage their federal carbon tax will do. We have made it clear that we intend to protect Ontario families and businesses from being punished by this discriminatory carbon tax. Response. While Premier Ford has been successful in making Ontario more competitive, we will continue to fight to ensure Ontario remains open for business. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his response. I agree we are disappointed the federal government did not match all the U.S. tax relief measures to make Ontario and Canada fully competitive. It's important that we make Canada, specifically Ontario, competitive on the world stage. For too long, we've watched business and investment flow out of this province and this country. It continues to be concerning that the federal Liberals will not yet tell Ontarians just how much their job-killing carbon tax is going to cost us. But we know there's more work to be done. We'll continue fighting for Ontario's families and businesses. Could the minister please explain what action will be taken following the federal government's fall economic statement? Minister. Thank you, Speaker. Well, uh, we are pleased to announce that Ontario will match the federal government's measure to accelerate the expensing of depreciable assets. Our government has advocated for this change over the past months, and we are excited to provide businesses with the incentive to make these new investments in Ontario's key industries. Our own fall economic statement last week took this possibility into account. We are prepared to implement this change immediately and with without any additional impact on our financial position. At the same time, we will pursue ways to make sure that every person in Ontario knows just how much the federal carbon tax will cost them. We will do everything in our power to protect people from being punished by a discriminatory federal carbon tax. Speaker, Response. after 15 years, Ontario is finally open for business, and we plan to keep it that way. Yeah. Yeah. Next question, the member for Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. The Conservatives have a lengthy record when it comes to cuts that hurt the most vulnerable Ontarians. The last PC government slashed social assistance by 21 per cent. In eight years in office, not once did they raise the minimum wage from $6.85 an hour. 
We've seen much of the same from this PC government, scrapping the basic income pilot, a 50 per cent cut to social assistance rate increases, rollback of minimum wage. Can the minister confirm whether today's social assistance announcement will be more cuts, more austerity and more suffering for vulnerable people? Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thanks very much for that question. You're going to be so surprised this afternoon yeah. when we have a plan for those who can work, a plan that offers a path out of poverty. We are going to, for those who cannot work, build in more and better and compassionate supports. I am so proud of this government and the team that we have built together over the past 114 days as we've looked at that $10 billion budget that is supporting almost one million people, but still one in seven are living in poverty. And I am so proud to be part of this government that's not only for the people, but for the most vulnerable people in this province. And we are going to continue to stand up, and I am going to be proud of this announcement today, and I will shock the Stop the clock. Once again, I will inform the government side that I had to stand up because I couldn't hear what the minister was saying because of the noise of the standing ovation. Start the clock. Supplementary. Back to the minister. Many recipients of Ontario Disability and Ontario Works have been anxiously awaiting this afternoon's social assistance announcement, and I mean anxiously. Some recipients have st shared stories of heightened anxiety and depression, and even suicidal thoughts, during this distressing period while this PC government decides their fate. Since such little information has been made available and there was zero, zero public consultation, we only have the PC's record of cuts and austerity to go off of when anticipating the results. Can the minister confirm whether she intends to follow the lengthy PC trend and continue to make life harder for our most vulnerable Ontarians? And I suggest you don't laugh after my question this time. Minister. If her questions weren't such a joke, maybe I wouldn't laugh. But, Speaker, let me tell you something. The previous Liberal government— can ask the minister to withdraw. Withdrawn. So, for the past 15 years, the previous Liberal government uh, consulted. We used those consultations. We consulted with people right across Ontario. In fact, I want to read this to the member opposite. Um, Ministers McLeod and Smith seemed to genuinely engage in the conversation and expressed appreciation to all who attended. We were encouraged by Minister McLeod's final comment that her ministry is the heart of the government and she is resolved that people will not reduce its deficit on the backs of the most vulnerable people. That is from Ed Bentley of the Poverty Roundtable of Prince Water. Edward Hastings. But let me be perfectly clear, today when we order. announce our path forward on social assistance, we will lift people up, we will instill compassion Response. into the program, and we will make sure those who can't and work will be working, and those who can't have the supports they need. Stop the call. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Ottawa South. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the acting premier. It's been a banner week for accountability in the Ford government. First, the Premier refuses to hold his Chief of Staff accountable for his actions. The Finance Minister opens the backroom door for union and corporate donations in his fall economic statement. More critically, the attack on independent officers of this legislature is unprecedented. The elimination of the Commissioner of the French Services is uh, really difficult. is wrong. And the government knows this because there are voices inside their own government that are telling them that it's wrong. Order. So, Speaker, through you, why is this government so afraid of accountability? Acting Premier. Thank you very much uh, to the member for the question. It's obvious, Premier, that he missed pages of the fall economic statement or missed the odd line because it's very clear that uh, with respect to uh, uh, fundraising, I realize that the Liberals were caught in a fundraising scandal, Speaker, and it caused many changes to come. Order. But, Speaker, what he is mentioning, what the member is mentioning uh, about uh, union and corporate donations is absolutely 
incorrect. Yeah. It's categorically wrong. That is not included in the fall economic yeah. statement. Instead, in fact, what is is the fact that uh, we will be mirroring the uh, federal, uh, closer mirroring the federal regulations, which which absolutely does not allow for corporate or or union donations. It's unfortunate, and, and I'm very worried he missed a lot of the other good things uh, in the fall economic statement, which I hope to add to in the response. Supplementary. Well, you must have forgot you removed the attestation about own funds. Exactly. But, and the minister can say whatever he exactly. wants about us, okay? But we didn't run around silencing our critics. It's pathological with these folks. Pathological. The decision to eliminate the child advocate is wrong, too. Government come to the child order. advocate is an independent voice for Niagara very West vulnerable children in this province. Children whose voices are the hardest to hear. And I know that the Minister of Children, I know that she knows in her heart that it's the wrong thing to do. So the government has also secretly moved to ex exercise the power of hiring and firing independent officers of this legislature based on their opinion. And if that's not an attack, I don't know what is. So back again to the Order. minister. To the minister, what is it you're so afraid of? Mm -hmm. Minister. Well, uh, Speaker, where do you go with that? I can tell you that the Liberal government did run around uh, creating, as the Auditor General called it, bogus financial documents. That's what the Liberals were busy doing. So it's obvious that he has, uh, the member has missed certain key pieces Order. of the fall economic statement. So for that member, I will remind that in our fall economic statement, we are bringing relief to one. 1.1 million individuals in the province of Ontario. Anyone earning $30,000 or less will no longer pay provincial income tax. Speaker, that is $500 million that is being returned into the pockets of the people of Ontario. When Premier Ford and our team was elected, we said relief is on the way. Well, Speaker, for those millions, relief is here. Stop the clock. Restart the clock. Next question. The member for Oakville. Hey! Thank you. My question is to the uh, Minister of Government and Consumer Services. We recently learned the disturbing news that Justin Trudeau's Liberal government has a brought in access to the personal financial information of Canadians Shame. through Statistics Canada Shame. without any consent. The Privacy Commissioner of Canada wasn't even aware of this and expressed grave concern. Mr. Speaker, the fact the federal government Shame. proposes collecting this sensitive data Order. is very concerning. It's important to recognize that their intention is to collect this data without even informing Canadians. Order. It was only revealed by the media. This is no way for a federal government to treat Ontarians and, and respect their vi violation of their privacy. Last week, I introduced the Bond, come to order. The member from Orleans, come to order. Can the minister inform us how this bill will protect Ontarians from, with their private information? Good question. Good question. Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Through you, I would like to thank the Honourable Member from Oakville for this excellent question and for bringing this piece of legislation forward in this House. I'm sure all members of this House have by now heard that Statistics Canada was gathering the private financial information of Canadians without their knowledge or consent. Simply put, this is unacceptable. Order. No level of government should be able to collect highly sensitive information like this without, at the very least, informing citizens of their actions. Instead, Mr. Speaker, what we have seen from the federal government is smoke-filled backroom decisions and data collection that would make Big Brother blush. We're not going to stand for it, Mr. Speaker. If Justin Trudeau isn't going to do something, we will. The Safeguarding Information Act, introduced by the member of Oakville, will require that government institutions Order. requesting personal information of citizens may only disclose information with the consent of the citizen. Yeah. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, I would like to thank the minister for the response and congratulate him on the action we are taking to protect Ontarians from federal overreach. Here, here. We in this House know that when consumers into credit agreements with banking and financial institutions, they disclose sensitive personal information. That information affects your credit score and affects your ability to get everything from a credit card to a mortgage to purchase a house. 
The federal government, in its decision, has overstepped into a realm of private data collection, Shame. which no previous government has felt necessary. Mr. Speaker, I ask the Minister of Government and Consumer Services to explain how this Order. legislation will protect consumers and how this will prevent the abuse from the federal Liberal government to sensitive information for Ontarians. Good. Minister. Thank you, Speaker. Again, I'd like to thank my honourable colleague for the question. We know this is an important issue for Ontarians and Canadians generally. A recent Nanos poll found 75 per cent of Canadians are opposed to Statistics Canada accessing their personal records without their consent, and 57 per cent wouldn't be comfortable consenting to giving up this personal information. Mr. Speaker, we won't allow the federal Liberal government in Ottawa to track purchases and credit scores of Ontarians without their consent. If the Safeguarding Our Information Act is passed, it will put the protection of consumers first. Government will need their consent before sharing this information. This is a necessary step in protecting the information of all insurance and will fill regulatory gaps that allow Justin Trudeau to pull data without citizens' knowledge or consent. Mr. Speaker, I'm proud to stand in this House and support this legislation, and I'll be proud to stand up for it when the bill is debated at second reading Come next on. Thursday, November 29th. Here, here. Thank you, Speaker. Next question, the member for University Rosedale. My question is to the Minister of Transportation. The full economic statement cut $1.4 billion for transit infrastructure compared to what was in the last budget. But the government failed to specify where these cuts are coming from and what transit projects could be on the chopping block. Can the minister explain what transit projects are in jeopardy because of this $1.4 billion cut? Minister of Transportation. Uh, thanks very much for uh, the question for the member opposite. I appreciate uh, having this opportunity to respond to you. Uh, look, what uh, we uh, did uh, mention and I announced uh, earlier this week is that we're going to be moving forward working with the city in Toronto and uploading uh, the TTC to uh, uh, the Metrolink. So we, we will be going forward after we work out a deal with the uh, city of Toronto uh, at uh, building, planning, designing new subways and also maintaining the track. And the city of Toronto, of course, will, will continue to run the, the subways and keep the fares that are collected. And by doing this me measure, we are creating efficiencies in our budgeting system. System, which will allow us to actually invest more as we grow and build the transit system across the entire GTH region. So thanks again for that question. I look forward to your supplemental. Supplementary. Before the election, the Premier promised to maintain funding for the Huron Ontario LRT, which is scheduled for completion in 2022. But the fall economic statement did not mention the Huron Ontario LRT at all. And last week, the government refused to confirm the project would be moving forward. Can the minister tell us, yes or no, will he be maintaining funding for the Huron Ontario LRT so that it can be completed by 2022 as planned? Minister. Uh, thanks again for that uh, question. Uh, we've had numerous discussions uh, in the ministry uh, reviewing all the projects going forward, and I can tell you uh, that we will be making the best decisions on behalf of the people of this province. Uh, you know, we have inherited a $15 billion deficit and over $300 billion in debt. Uh, we have to make sure we're making decisions that are going to work for the people of the GTHA. And as I said, as we're uploading uh, the TTC, we are going to be creating a, a, a regional structure uh, across the GTHA. And under the leadership of Metrolinx, uh, we are going to be making some good decisions for the people of this province, and we're going to be expanding uh, the transit opportunities. Uh, uh, the Huron LRT is, is still uh, having a great discussion about within our ministry, and uh, we look forward to having a great uh, announcement with you uh, in, in a short time forward. Thank Solid. you very much. Thank you. Next question, the member for Scarborough, Rouge Park. Thank you, Speaker. My, my question is for the Minister of Finance. Our government ran on a commitment to put more money in people's pockets. Premier Ford made it clear people in Ontario pay enough taxes already. Unfortunately, this is not something the previous Liberal government understood. We have been doing everything we can to bring relief to the people of Ontario from 15 years of Liberal tax and spend policies. We have done, we have taken action like stopping the hike on driver's license fees. We have taken action like scrapping the punishing cap and trade carbon tax. The point is every dollar counts. Can the minister please explain the steps taken in our fall economic statement to provide further tax relief to the hardworking people of Ontario? Mr. Finance. Uh, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from uh, Scarborough Rouge Park. 
The previous Liberal government raised our taxes every single chance they got. The Liberals' 2018 budget planned to further punish the hardworking people of Ontario with changes to the rates, brackets, surtax and credits for Ontario's personal income tax. We made it clear during the election that we would not implement these Liberal tax increases, and as a result, Speaker, seniors, those with disabilities, and those who claim Ontario's medical expense tax credit will benefit the most. Our government's decision will save about 150,000 people with allowable Ontario medical expenses, $320 on average. Our decision will save these taxpayers $35 million. Speaker, that's money that will stay in their pockets. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his response. We are so happy that the days of unfair Liberal tax highs are over. The people of Ontario deserve a break, especially the seniors and those living with disabilities, as the Minister mentioned. While the Liberals were fo too focused on funding their out-of-control spending and waste, our economic false statement turned the page on 15 years of mismanagement. Our decision not to proceed with liberal tax hikes is just one of the ways we are letting Ontarians keep more money, the hard-earned money in their pockets. But we are also cutting taxes for those who need relief the most. Could the minister please explain the tax relief we are Question. bringing to the people of Ontario who need the most? Minister. Thank you, Speaker. Our legislation, if passed, would introduce one of the most generous tax cuts for low-income workers in a generation, the low-income individuals and families tax cut or lift. Premier Ford proposes that anyone earning $30,000 or less a year should pay no personal income tax in Ontario. This change, if passed, would provide tax relief to 1.1 million people. Now, unfortunately, the NDP do not want to talk about this much-needed relief. In fact, as I said earlier, the NDP, uh, MPP from Hamilton West, Ancaster, Dundas, thinks we are, quote, talking about people who earn so little that, in fact, they don't need a tax break. I'm talking about $500 million they don't want to share with the people. We will never back down from bringing relief to the people who need it most. Stop the clock. Order. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Niagara Falls. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question to is the Minister of Transportation. The Premier promised the people of Niagara that he would deliver all-way, two-way service to Niagara Falls. But the word Niagara is completely missing from the fall economic statement. But was there was $1.4 billion, billion cut to transit infrastructure. The Premier of Ontario, the Premier of Ontario has committed to expand Go Rail service to Grinsby, to Grinsby, St. Catharines, and all the way to Niagara Falls by 2023. Will the minister Confirm that the Premier will live up to his commitment to bring all way, two way, go rail service all the way to Niagara Falls. Member for Niagara West, planned. come to order. <laughs> for transportation. Thank you uh, very much for that uh, question from the member opposite, and, and I, I do appreciate uh, receiving the questions today. It's, it's nice to uh, have this conversation in the legislature. Uh, look, uh, we've, we've made a promise to improve two way. Uh, go service uh, across this uh, this region, and uh, we're living up to that uh, plan. Um, you know, we have implemented the largest go train service increase in over five years, and we're reducing congestions throughout the GTHA. In fact, uh, there's already 220 new trips per week on the Go Lakeshore corridor. That's an increase of uh, almost 18 percent. By enhancing transportation across this region, we are starting to kickstart the economy. We're moving people. We're going to be moving goods, and Ontario truly Order. is open for business under the PC government led by Premier Doug Ford. Falls, 
supplementary. The member for Waterloo. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is also to the Minister of Transportation. Before the election, the Premier promised to deliver two-way all-day GO service to Kitchener as quickly as possible. But since the election, we have heard nothing. The words GO Transit and Regional Express Rail were completely missing from the fall economic statement. But what was there was a $1.4 billion cut to transit infrastructure spending, despite the fact that transit is an economic driver. When will the minister deliver two-way all-day GO service to Kitchener? Because they have waited long enough. Minister. And Harris, Kitchener, Thank you uh, very much uh, again for that question, and I really do appreciate uh, uh, discussing policy here. I, I, it's uh, not too often we get great questions on policy. And look, I do have to call out my colleagues on, on the PC caucus, the member from Niagara West, uh, the member from Kitchener Conestoga, the member from Kitchener uh, South, Southwest. So South Hessler, excuse me. You know what? They've been strong advocates for improving GO Transit across this province, particularly in the regions. And you know what? This is an issue the whole House agrees upon. We need to get Ontario moving again, and that's what we're going to be doing. Stay tuned. That's all I can tell the members opposite. Stay tuned because good things are happening in Ontario, and Ontario is open for business as we go forward. Order. Start the clock. Member for York Centre. Hard question of the day. Hard question of the day. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Transportation. Congratulations on your new portfolio, Minister. Yesterday, the Minister delivered remarks at the Toronto Region Board of Trade on our government's plan for transit, and we couldn't be more excited. Our government. Our government for the people understands the vital service that the Toronto Transit Commission provides. The TTC subway is the third largest system in North America with over half a billion riders in 2017. Wow. I'm proud to be one of those riders. <laughs> Approximately Mr. Speaker, we got to get moving on the TTC. Yes. Or more importantly, we got to get riding. Yes. Can the minister please tell the House on our government's plan to revitalize the TTC subway system for the people of Ontario? Yes. Minister of Transportation. Thank you uh, very much, and thanks for that uh, question from the member of York Centre, another strong voice in our caucus. And I, I, I omitted uh, the member from Cambridge. I couldn't tell you how many times she has advocated for expanded boat transit into the kitchen. I'm, I'm sorry for doing that. So, listen, uh, I, I want to take this opportunity to thank the Toronto Region Board of Trade for inviting me to speak to them yesterday, and I'm really happy that my parliamentary assistant, uh, Kinga Surma, was with me at that time. Thanks very much, Kinga, another strong advocate, and I want to thank my co-ministers, um, Minister McNaughton and Mr. Clark, for also attending. Our government for the people has been clear in its commitment to improve transit and transportation experiences in the City of Toronto by asking ourselves these questions. How do we make life easier for commuters? How can we get tourists and transit users moving faster? How do we achieve the best value for our customer, the Ontario taxpayer? We will be uploading components of the TTC to the province Response. because our government for the people is committed to treating the subway like a vital service that it is. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, I'm so grateful to the minister for the plan and for the answer. My favorite three words in the English language, Mr. Speaker, subway, subway, subway. Subway, subway, subway. All right. <laughs> but unfortunately, the current, the current approval process in the city, and despite what my friends in the No Development Party say, the current plan by the city does not work. It's timely, costly, and ineffective. Take this Padina extension for a sec. In the great writing of York Center, over budget, over time by about four years. This is, not a way, this is not a way for us to do business. This is not the way our government is going to approach transit in this province. Can the minister please expand on our government's plan to upload the TTC subway system? Minister. Thank you again for that question, member opposite. And, and uh, as the member stated, the, the current planning and approval process is far too onerous, costly, and it's failing to provide Ontarians with the best and most efficient subway system that they deserve. Fixing this was a key election promise from our party. 
and the people of Ontario answered that promise by electing a PC majority government in this province. That's why we've now crafted a solution. To upload components of the TTC to the province, our government has a greater capacity to fund these projects, which will facilitate the development of our transit projects. One of the first steps of this process was last August appointing Special Advisor Michael Lindsay to work to determine the best approach for this upload. Looking ahead, we're looking forward to working further with the City of Toronto to develop the plan and implement it in the new year to upload the TCC and provide the regional uh, transit planning and operations and implementation that we Spons. can do. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Question the member for Ottawa. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Speaker. And my question is also to the Minister of Transportation. The pre The Premier promised to deliver two-way, all-day GO service to the fine folks of Bowmanville, but since the election we have been told that all transit projects are under review, including projects that the Premier had specifically promised to deliver. And the fall economic statement showed an unexplained $1.4 billion in cuts, to in cuts to transit infrastructure expenditures. So, I'm hopeful that the Minister will please reassure those fine folks in Bowmanville and the Durham region and answer. When will the minister deliver two-way, all-day GO service to Bowmanville? Minister of Transportation. Thank you again to the member from Oshawa uh, for that question. Uh, I, I miss sitting in committee with her that we used to sit in back in uh, the last session, so it's appreciative to get the question. And I'm feeling a little bit like the Minister of Environment today, getting lots of questions, so I'm appreciative. Listen, uh, we are doing a, a review of all the projects going yes. on in yes. the Ministry of Transportation. Uh, we're starting to focus on the upload of the Toronto TTC, which will enable us to have more funding available for transit across the region and Ontario as a whole. Um, you know, we've already uh, had some expansion with the GO service, and we're looking here, forward here. to continuing to see how we can expand uh, GO service, but not only GO service, but regional transportation across the region to make sure that it's integrated, to make yes. sure uh, the fares are coming closer in line. Uh, Mr. Speaker, this is going to be a great four years for the PC Response. Party and the government of Ontario and for the province of Ontario as a whole, and I'm really looking forward to the next four years. Thank you very much. Supplementary, the member for Ottawa Centre. Speaker, back to the minister. In 2016, the provincial government committed a billion dollars in funding for phase two of the Ottawa LRT. Construction is scheduled to begin next year, but the fall economic statement makes absolutely no reference to the project. In fact, it only predicts a 1.4 billion cut to transit infrastructure spending. Will the minister confirm that the province will fund a billion dollars towards the second phase of the Ottawa LRT so that construction can begin next year as planned? An answer would be lovely. Minister of Transportation. Thank you for that question uh, from the member from uh, uh, Ottawa Centre. It's uh, nice to receive a question from you. Uh, look. As I said before, uh, we're doing a great review of, of the projects that are ongoing in this, this province. We haven't walked away at all from the Ottawa uh, LRT expansion. I can tell you uh, the members from the Ottawa region that are pushing hard in our caucus are strong voices for the people. Uh, we've got the member from um, Ottawa West Nepean. We've got, of course, Ottawa Nepean, um, Glen Perry Prescott, Russell, of course. Uh, you know we've got and Carlton and Carlton and Carlton. Oh, there you are. Listen. I'm hearing their voices, I'm hearing your voices, and what are we going to do Order. is we're going to ensure that transit is built in this province. Uh, the L Ottawa LRT is still on track, and uh, you know, I, I look forward to continuing working with you as we go forward. Thank you very much. Next question. The member for Eglinton Lawrence. Education. Minister, far too often we hear about incidents of bullying across this province. Bullying can happen anywhere at home or in so social settings in our community. I'm most troubled when I hear of this happening in our schools. We know bullying can have major impacts not only on physical health but also on mental health as well. Mr. Speaker, our government has been clear that we're committed to ensuring safe and supportive learning environments for all students across Ontario. When a child arrives at school, they should feel welcome and they should feel safe. 
Minister, as Bullying Awareness and Prevention Week comes to a close, can you tell us more about how our government will continue to raise awareness on this issue throughout the year? Great Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Speaker. First of all, I want to thank the member from eglinton Lawrence because she is leading with her heart. She does a great job on she behalf does. of her <laughs> So, but I want to share with you that too often, far too often, Speaker, we hear about incidents of bullying across this province, and it absolutely breaks my heart. Bullying can happen anywhere, at home, in social settings, in our communities, and in some instances right here in the House. I'm most troubled, though, when I hear of this happening in our schools. We know bullying can have major impacts on not only physical health, but mental health as well. Mr. Speaker, our government has been clear that we are committed to ensuring safe and supportive learning environments for students throughout Ontario. When a child arrives at school, they should feel welcome Spons. and they should feel safe. Minister, or Speaker, as Bullying Awareness and Prevention Week comes to a close, you know what? We are putting our best foot forward with all our, 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 all our efforts. Excuse me. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister, for your response. On behalf of my constituents, I want to thank the government for ensuring bullying prevention is a conversation which is happening all year long. Mr. Speaker, the minister is right. Everyone in this House needs to get involved in this conversation and do their part to prevent bullying from happening in their own communities and to provide supports to those who need it most. We know that bullying can have long-term effects on its victims. Minister, what can MPPs do, and where can we turn when we learn of incidents of bullying in our communities? Minister. Thank you, Speaker. And back to the member from Eglinton Lawrence. And again, there's so much that we can do, and you lead by example in that regard. And every member in this House needs to know there are so many supports, not only in their own riding, but throughout the province. Just yesterday morning, I spent time at the Kids Help Phone in Toronto. It's phenomenal what they do. The counselors they have on staff, the volunteers that are in place are reaching out to people when, when they're looking for help throughout this amazing province. And, and I say amazing because technology has brought everyone together through the Kids Help phone. And I love what they're doing so much in that they are reaching out through every social channel available to them. It's just not on the phone, but also it's through every social channel. Response. And you know what? I was inspired to see people dedicated to supporting children 24-7, seven days a week. And they also acknowledge at the Kids Help phone line that there are other initiatives like West for Youth, Get in Touch for Hutch, and so many more. And we need to work Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> Next question, the member for Key um, I have a, My question is to the Minister of uh, Transportation. <laughs> uh, remote uh, populations served by Ontario remote airports um, are among the fastest growing in northwestern Ontario, northern Ontario. And then also, we, uh, Mr. Speaker, we have to understand these airports are actually lifelines for the communities that they serve. But Ontario's northern uh, airport investments uh, have not kept up with the, uh, with the need. And because of that, uh, there has been situations where people uh, have not received urgent medical attention because planes, helicopters were not available to land. Millions of dollars in groceries uh, and medicines have spoiled because they could not be delivered. So my question, uh, Mr. Speaker, has the government be begun to engage with flying First Nations communities uh, in the far north to begin discussion on essential improvements to these airports? Minister of Transportation. Thank you very much uh, for that conversation, uh, that question, and uh, you know, you know, it's right. It, it, we need to uh, improve uh, transportation. Uh, within the north, especially with our indigenous populations, and uh, we have an understanding of that to uh, connect communities, to ensure they have op opportunity to uh, receive supplies, to receive medical help, to move to and fro out of the area, and uh, we understand that. And 
Um, the Ministry of Transportation is working with the Minister of Energy, Northern Development and Mines uh, to address these issues. Uh, we're starting for it. Has the Ministry started that engagement? I've been on the job for 15 days. I'm still getting the briefings, and I'll find out for you what they're doing, and I'll give them my commitment. If they haven't, I'll tell them to get working on it. I'll give you that much. Thank you. Supplementary. Answer. Good answer. These airports, um, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, serve a critical role uh, for the safety and the well-being uh, uh, and of the people in the far north communities. And yes, uh, there has been uh, needless deaths, unnecessary suffering uh, due to the lack of landing approach infrastructure uh, for these remote airports. Uh, Mr. Speaker, could I, uh, the Minister of Transporta Transportation tell the House how he plans to begin working with the remote northwestern, northwestern northern communities uh, in the north uh, so the basics like up-to-date landing instrumentation uh, equipment is available to these airports. Uh, Minister. Minister, Minister of Northern Affairs and uh, Indigenous Affairs. Thank you. Speaker, I... Minister of Energy, Northern Development and Mines, Minister of Indigenous Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to respond to this question. Of course, what I think about, and the member from Kuwait and I were just youngsters, but there was a great progressive conservative minister he was called the Emperor of the North, and he is, in fact, the guy who started to build those very airports and runways in all of those isolated communities. That's very well documented. We can continue, Mr. Speaker, to remain committed to the opportunity of opening up our northern communities, to ensure that we have the social, health and economic benefits that are afforded to those isolated communities by building corridors to prosperity. Electrification and road access is just as essential as any other form of transportation infrastructure. We're going to be Response. talking about that in the next couple of months. There's going to be a budget to support that. We just hope the member will stand with us and vote to support better transportation for northern Ontario. Next question, member for Simcoe North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Training, Colleges and Universities. Minister, I was happy to sponsor the Ontario Electrical League reception this morning, and I know they've also met with many MPPs on both sides of the House, and I also see many of the OEL members here in the gallery too. OEL members were very excited about the passing of Bill 47 yesterday, especially the changes to the journey person to apprentice ratios. Here, here. Here, here. They were also telling me how they will now be able to hire more apprentices. We know there is a demand for skilled trades in Ontario. Can the minister tell us what our government is doing to create better jobs and fill these job shortages within our province? The Minister of Training, Colleges and Universities. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you to the member opposite for her strong advocacy. Uh, we promised the people of Ontario to create good jobs and uh, good paying jobs and make Ontario open for business. We want to work with employers, unions, employees, businesses to make sure that happens and to fulfill our promise to the people. Modernizing the Ontario Coll of College of Trades and standardizing ratios are key steps to delivering on those core promises to Ontarians. The current system was not, or was not working, and uh, we need to change that. It wasn't working for the, the, the trades. It wasn't working for employers, and it wasn't working for Ontario. We need a system that gets Ontario's economy moving and fills that skills gap. Groups like the Ontario Electrical League, we've heard from, and we want to make sure that we move forward with changes Response. that are positive for, for business employers and employees. The Premier was clear with the people of Ontario during the campaign that our government will fill that skills gap by increasing— That concludes question period. Member for Essex on a point of order. On a point of order, Speaker. Uh, Speaker, two days ago, I had a private conversation with you, a serious conversation about the need to spread some holiday cheer around this place. I asked you, uh, as members would know, uh, we only had about a week to uh, experience the wonderment of this building as it's adorned for the holidays. And I asked you to use your vast powers in this building <laughs> to see if you could expedite that process. And I'm happy and thankful that you did so 
and we now have a 12-foot Christmas tree to adorn the grand staircase outside. I so I just wanted to thank you for doing that. <laughs> to all a good night. No, I, I appreciate the member for Essex uh, pointing that out. Uh, certainly, uh, if the tree is there, it's wonderful. We can we can get into the Christmas spirit in here, and I want to express my appreciation to the staff of the Legislative Assembly who made it possible to get the tree. Uh, point of order. Point of order. The member for Scarborough Agent Court. Forgot to mention that the reception for the Lebanese Independence Day celebration will take place in room 230. Uh, it is hosted by the World Lebanese Cultural Union, and uh, at the same time, I would like to add the, uh, or mention the rest of the delegation who were here earlier. The, consul, uh, the honorary consul, Grégoire Bostagian, his wife, Desiree Bostagian, uh, Elias Kassab, Mary Musa, Father Habib Tanuri, Father Walid Khouri, Father Ibrahim El Haddad, Mr. Fadi Khemi, John uh, Jadon, Eli Jadon, and Hanan Dagher. Thank you very much. Did the member for Scarborough Guildwood have a point? Point of order, Speaker. Uh, it's my pleasure, if I may, to introduce Jean Francois. Leroux, who is, uh, has done such great work with Conseil Scolaire Viamont, and but I know today he's here to uh, be with his son, uh, Vincent. So it's wonderful to have you, and thank you for being here today. Pursuant to Standing Order 38A, the Leader of the Official Opposition is given notice of her dissatisfaction with the answer to her question given by the Acting Premier concerning the Premier's Chief of Staff. This matter will be debated Tuesday at 6 p.m. Pursuant to Standing Order 38A, the Member for Ottawa South has given notice of his dissatisfaction with the answer to his question given by the Acting Premier concerning accountability. This matter will be debated Tuesday at 6 p.m. There being no deferred votes. This House is recessed until 1 p.m.